you can have all kinds of conflict, but coming back and doing the repair is really the sign of a healthy relationship. And the research shows that the quicker the repair, the healthier the relationship. So meaning if you had um, a hurt and you haven't dealt with it in 10 years, it, that's a sign of unhealth. Or um, a hurt and I'll say, well, I'll let her be the one to come back and apologize first. Right. Okay. <laughs> so, or minimizing and thinking I it's no big deal. Think. Welcome to the Living Wholehearted Podcast, helping leaders live with integrity. So welcome back. It's Jeff and Tara, and we are going to talk about conflict today. And we just solved a really big conflict in our own marriage as we got two separate mics for our podcast. Really hoping that this solves a lot of conflict. <laughs> you would not probably notice that underneath the table, I've been like jabbing Jeff in the middle of sharing a mic of just a lot of different quirks. And that doesn't work very well in a marriage. So I'm not giving that as advice. <laughs> Under the table signals are not really recommended because you just don't know exactly what they're trying to say. I know. I know. Well, here's where we're going to go. We're going to talk about the root of every conflict. We're going to talk about tools for regulating and triggers. We're going to talk about understanding your communication style. And then we're going to just give some tips on really what solves 80% of conflicts. If you can listen to one another and seek some sense of unity, you can apply this to your board meetings. You can apply this to your friendships to your parenting, but we're going to use our marriage as kind of the foundation of how to walk through conflict well. Yeah. So we're both business partners also, in addition to being married and parents. <laughs> so that adds a, a, a unique element to some, some of you in our listening audience may have that in common and we like it, it but it's, it's not for everybody, right? Well, and I think one thing that we'll set up is we're both oldest children. So our families of origin, the families that we grow up in, and even the order of which we were born into our families add a lot to the flavor of conflict. So some of us grow up in um, conflict averse families where maybe you don't see a lot of conflict um, outside of closed doors. The problem with that is you don't see a lot of resolution and oftentimes there's a fear of conflict thinking if we have conflict, there's a problem. And other homes saw a lot of conflict, maybe with no resolution, which also can create either a desire or familiarity with conflict and chaos um, or a fear around, I don't want conflict because I have no clue how to resolve this. So the bottom line is that conflict is actually good for a relationship. What do I mean by that, Jeff? Well, the right kind of conflict, right? Yeah, and uh, the healthy conflict, which in in every sphere or system that we work in, we're trying to help people to understand to turn towards uh, healthy conflict. Unhealthy conflict would be, you know, abuse and all those other factors that might go in there. And there's lots of forms of abuse. So we're not talking about that, but we're talking about healthy conflict, disagreements, rubs, things that were our wirings are just crossing over one another and we're missing each other, yeah. which happens every day and all the time with, especially with people that we say that we love the most. So uh, how do we see conflict as an opportunity, right? An opportunity to, to grow and mature, uh, as adults and to help, if you're a parent, help your kids grow and mature with reps, right? Repetitions and practice. That's a good point. It does take practice. So if you didn't get a lot of practice growing up or in um, your relationships and it's new to you, give yourself grace to know that it takes a while to build just like working out. If you start with five pounds, it's going to take a while for that five pounds to feel normal and you be ready for a more intensity the same as with conflict resolution. So just giving yourself grace. Yeah. The other thing that plays a role in how we do conflict is our wirings. And we do talk a lot about the core values index. We'll talk more about our communication styles today mm -hmm. and how that's playing a role. So you're thinking about your own family of origin, the family you grew up in and how they did conflict or didn't do conflict. Yeah, and in my family, I can just describe this pretty openly because my family actually is kind of all fractured, unfortunately. But uh, and part of that was just, they didn't really do conflict. Um, that's part of the part of the equation. But yeah, my family, uh, my parents did not uh, uh, fight, if you will, or do conflict in front of us uh, very well. It was always very suppressed. And mm -hmm. usually my mom was trying to, you know, cut it off and would be giving signals or just, you know, go 
silent. I just had a moment. Signals <laughs> trigger you. Whoops. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Signals, they do just kind of trigger me. Okay. And, and, you know, but I could see maybe in one of my parents' faces that turning red. So it was like they were trying to keep the lid on. And, you know, in some respects, that's that's good. In some respects, not to have explosions in front of kids. Uh, mm. I have a, a younger brother and a younger sister. Um, but sometimes those doors to, to their bedroom were shut and then it would, you know, we'd hear some things, but we never really heard or saw them process conflict in front of us in any way, in, uh, appropriately or, um, uh, and never saw, uh, or heard or witnessed how they resolved. So I, I didn't have really any practice, uh, from my family of origin experience and, um, I'd have to get a lot of practice and a lot of help after that, right? So when I went to college um, in navigating conflicts, I had to get some counseling to try to navigate the conflicts from my own family and process that without my family members. And uh, it takes a lot of work. So maybe some of you that are listening are like, wow, I really resonate with that. Like it wasn't seen, it wasn't heard. You can imagine, of course, my surprise that when uh, uh, when I was in high school, um, the announcement that my parents were separating and my dad was moving out mm. that very night that, uh, of of hearing that news, mm. that it was a total shock and a curveball, um, and because uh, we just didn't witness anything leading up to that uh, as it related to conflict in front of us that made sense to us as kids growing up. Yeah, I, I remember some of our early mentors um, when we were dating were Les and Leslie Parrott, and they did a lot of talking about healthy conflict and that really you have to learn how to fight fair, giving what we would say now today, each other a voice. You have a voice. I have a voice. And how do we remain present, which is how do we not get triggered and think about and get stuck in the past or always ruminate about the future and really being present right here also practically not being on our phones yeah, and being distracted in the moment yeah, yeah thinking about other things pretending like you're listening but really going somewhere else <laughs> in your head nobody does that nobody does that. <laughs> okay so thank you for being vulnerable about that jeff and sure. i know you've shared that in other places um but it makes you give you an example of how to start thinking about your own family and how it's influencing it influences the way you do conflict at work it influences the way you do conflict with your kids with your family um, and even with our dear efforts, you know, our honest efforts to want to do it different than maybe when what we saw, you can't just come out of the gate. If you've never been around good basketball players and want to just start playing basketball, you're going to probably develop some funky skills. So having coaches. And so today we want to coach a little bit and give some key things that really help in healthy communication and conflict. So one of the things in marriage, I'm a marriage and family therapist by trade. And one of the things I found in most conflicts, Jeff, was that at the core, there was an unmet need in a family of origin that we are trying to get met in marriage over and over and over. And so the question that I would often ask is, what did you want the most from your mom and your dad that you didn't get? And for people who had really healthy, good families, that's a really hard question. But if you really ponder it long enough, you'll probably figure out that there was maybe one element. Maybe it's you're the youngest and you always got last choice or it felt unheard. Or maybe you were the oldest and you felt like the responsibility was always on you. And so there's these undercurrent emotions um, and associations that are a part of our neural pathways that are playing out in our relationships today as adults. So that question is always a good question for everybody to ask because it's a cue to what are your main needs that you're trying to get met in your marriage. Any thoughts on that, Jeff? Well, maybe let's use an example and talk about, you know, identifying what that was and then what do you do with it, right? Well, I think the key of identifying what it is can be different for everyone. And so one example yeah. would be feeling like you're not heard. So you might do one of two things in a conflict. You might back off quickly and do the shutdown um, and just be like, eh, what's the point? My voice doesn't matter. And then long term in marriage or in relationships that can get really gunky because you have this tape playing over and over. What's the point? I never get heard. You always get what you want. Um, it looks beautiful in the beginning of a relationship because you seem very 
easygoing. Oh, okay. Okay. Now, <laughs> now we're getting somewhere because, but, but that's a new person, right? That's not your parents and your family of origin. It's your spouse. And so at the beginning, it doesn't show up. Um, the spouse thinks that it's, it's wonderful. You're so easygoing. You listen, you're such a great listener, but this person inside is replaying a tape. That's an old tape. It's not a new tape and it needs to be interrupted is what I'm hearing you say. Yeah. Or it could look a different way. So for someone who didn't get heard in their family of origin or had maybe everybody was really loud. And so you might feel like you always have to be very demonstrative and demanding in order to get what you need uh, met in your relationship. Again, early on in, in our relationships, we tend to be softer, but over time, these are the wears and tears on a relationship. And we have to work on these again and again, coming back to the core. So knowing what your core needs are, your unmet needs that you're trying to get met in your marriage really help you untangle the toothpaste conflicts, like whether we're going to have the, the toothpaste, you know, lid on or we're squeezing, are we going to throw it out before it's all done? Or do we need to like squeeze every last piece out? Does the toilet paper um, get put <laughs> on the um, thing this way or the opposite way? Uh, yeah. Those and it kinds really of isn't about the toilet paper no. or the toothpaste. No. It's about being heard and having yeah. our voice be a part of the equation. Mm -hmm. Um Okay, so what do you do with it? It's really, it's helping calm down the you always, I nevers and kind of recognizing yeah. that there's an undercurrent here that God is trying to help us grow in the opportunity yeah. for these conflicts to be a place of growth. So use that example, right? So if the example was, I di wasn't really heard in my family of origin, and I'm realizing right now in my marriage, whether it's a, you know, you're, you're just getting started as a couple or you, it's 20, 20 years in and you're recognizing this, which can happen. You're recognizing this came from that spot. Now, what do we do about that? Right? You want to communicate with your spouse that you, why that injury is like that? Why, mm -hmm. why are you vulnerable or susceptible or triggered when you, um, and where it came from? And then what you're, what are you asking, um, your significant other to help you with, right? In, in creating new neural pathways that change that, that tape, that old tape. Mm. Talk about that a little bit. Yeah. So you just, uh, were kind of speaking to the idea of reframing it as an invitation to help me heal here, help me grow. It requires vulnerability, as you said, and it also requires a little bit of trust with your significant other or those that you're in relationship with to say, I'm going to tell you something that is a vulnerability for me mm -hmm. and you need to, as my spouse, to hold it with care. And so giving mm -hmm. an informed consent way of like, I need to share something with you about when we have conflict, it's touching on something that I experienced growing up. It doesn't mean you're the reason okay. I'm experiencing it. It means I came into the relationship with this wounding and every time you bump up against it, it hurts again. And the wound is dot, 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 I'm feeling unheard. I have a hard time getting my voice heard, mm -hmm. my needs met. And I know you want to meet those needs. So giving the benefit of the doubt, if this is a healthy relationship mm -hmm. or we're working through healthy conflict, we're believing the best in one another. Is that yes. fair? Yes. Yeah, that's what we're talking about. And so then what you do is you say, you begin to uh, a significant other spouse can say, so what, what do I do? What are the behaviors that I do that make, that begin to bring that forward for you where that, where you feel like you're not going to be heard or the, some of those, those old tape messages. So then you start getting practical and that might take some time. And, you know, sometimes it's helpful because the most recent trigger could be just five minutes ago or a moment ago. And you'd be like, well, just like when you said this, this would be one thing and kind of unpack it together. Right. Mm -hmm. Uh, the spouse isn't going to be, you know, taking it personally because they're, they're walking with them together. I'm reminded of kind of one of the th phrases that you use often and came up with is great. You know, we're hurt in relationships and we are also healed in relationships. I don't know if you borrowed that from somebody else. Or if that was, okay. <laughs> so you borrowed that from somebody else, but it's so true. So here um, in a r loving relationship that is perfectly imperfect and needs to continue to be tweaked and worked and grow and mature, you are coming to this believing that, gosh, I, I want to be a part of healing in relationship with you yeah. and you for me. So that's the posture that you're coming into with this. And so after then identifying the, some practical things that behaviors that maybe the spouse was unaware of and didn't know that they were impacting their significant other in that way, 
it's good to take note of what that is. I'm a, I'm like a sticky note guy. So I might write a little code word or whatever and put it in places so that I can begin to practice and keep it in front of me. I might check in with you to mm. say, Hey, I've been working on this. How, you know, any feedback is, am I doing a better job in this way? Um, of course it's wonderful when you offer unsolicited feedback to say, Hey, that was great. Thank you for, for helping me with this, you mm. know, and, and that's how a, a loving couple begins to work and to create those new neural pathways that only happen through experiences so that when the same stimulus comes up, new, um, new responses, healthier responses actually can happen, which is pretty miraculous when we think about the neuroscience and how that works. Yeah. And the new neural pathways come up with, okay, I'm now in a relationship. Let's say that the wounding, I'm just going to use me just because the confusing part of talking about a couple out there yeah. is making me confused. So I'll just say, if I am feeling like I've been unheard uh -huh. in my story and in our relationship, and I want to practice having being heard okay. and you are doing all the things like writing it on the sticky note and wanting to understand the stimulus and and practicing a better new way then it is my job to continue to give um, opportunities for new experiences and it mm -hmm. means i need to speak up it's not a one and done it's not like we had this conversation already you should know by now no, we need reps we need lots of reps <laughs> and there's going to be places where um in real time we're practicing it so it might be you know jeff is like how am i doing and i could say at that point because he's asking for feedback saying, you're doing really great. Here's where it felt really good the other day when you allowed me to share for longer than you probably wanted to listen. And that felt really good. But the other, just yesterday, maybe, you know, you were, you were rushed in between meetings and I had a couple of things I wanted to say, and I didn't know how to handle that. Can we work on that? So this is where the back and forth, the practicing, you can't, as the person who's trying to heal in the relationship, expect a one time one and done. And so it's an ongoing vulnerability. And guess what happens when I'm practicing using my voice? I'm healing in that process. And when Jeff is practicing meeting that need and being sensitive to the the vulnerability, we are both healing my wounding. And mm -hmm. vice versa, we would be doing that for things that Jeff would have in the relationship as well. Most couples, if not 99.99999 both people walk into the relationship with more uh, with needs and wounds. But there are times when one spouse has way more and usually it's because they've come from maybe a more harmful or chaotic home system. Um, but most of the time, every couple, it's a give and a take and we're working on trying to meet both those needs in the conflict resolution process. Okay. And I just had like this, as you were speaking, I was present listening, but I just had a thought that just jumped in my head. And some of Say you it. listeners might actually be thinking the same thing. I thought of the Eagles and I thought of their song, get over it. All right. <laughs> so what do, what do we say to that message, which is just get over it. Right. And, and Don Henley in the, in the song talks about, you know, like to find your little inner child and kick it's basically behind. Right. So, so what we say to this, we say, yeah, you can take that response. How's that going for you over your life, right? It doesn't really work to just get over something. You actually have to go through it to get, to really get over it. You have to go through it and you have to, we know that trauma is stored in the body and we're not, we're not like saying that, um, like this is an opportunity to blame your parents for everything that you've experienced in your life. No, but we are saying you got to trace its roots and it makes sense. Let's get smart about how and use the best neuroscience um, and integrate our, our good theology with this process to, to take practical steps to actually heal it. This is, this is um, the path for healing is, is available to us. We have to choose to go through it. So you suppressing, pretending never really works. You got to move through things, turn towards each other. And it takes a lot of practice, right? In certain relationships, there might be conflict all the time and it's kind of exhausting. Anybody out there feel that, feel that at times where it's just like, or maybe you're going through a season where it's just a lot of conflict happening between you and your significant other. But some of you are coming in and you didn't have, both of you didn't have models that practice this mm. very much at all. You can have one family that, that had conflict all the time. It was the norm. It was loud. It was maybe more than loud. Um, 
And another, another cup, uh, the other person in the relationship came from a conflict avoidant home where it was quiet and nobody knew that there was conflict, like the home that I was raised in by and large. So you get two people like that together and all of a sudden it's really scary for that one person. And the other person is feeling like we never talk about anything, you know, let's, how do we even move through any conflict with you being an avoidant person? Well, and to your point, Jeff, is that when you don't move through conflict or engage and lean into it and go to this level, this is where people will say, especially in marriage, we're growing apart. Mm -hmm. We're falling out of love. It's because we've lost track of one another's hearts and what life is really about. I mean, honestly, focusing on what's for dinner and the next vacation only goes so far (laughs) in a relationship. And so the intimacy, the depth, Mm -hmm. the history, the trust um, really is where we're growing as we lean in to this opportunity. And for anyone who maybe says, I follow Christ and I want to do this the Christ way. And there's a lot of scriptures that we can pull out of context and to say, well, biblically it is get over it. Paul says, I put what's behind me behind me and I run the race that before me. (laughs) And yet I can say, if you follow the life of Paul, you see a lot of work that he has done. He spent That's a true. lot of time in the desert with God. He he had to deal with his past. He had an arrogant, he was a murderer. And he mentions that in other places where he's been humbled to recognize. Um, so this idea that he just all of a sudden puts everything behind him and moves on it is out of context yeah. of the work he's already done. There is a point at some point where we have to say, okay, we dealt with that. Mm-hmm. Now let's deal with today and instead of what happened 10 years ago. But if we haven't dealt with what happened 10 years ago or in our childhood, then that's going to keep haunting us it's along le- the way. It's leaking. And uh, and you may not even be aware of it, but other people in your life might be very aware of it. <laughs> okay. Well, let's keep moving. Okay. Um, was there anything else you want to say about that? No, I think that's okay. it. Cool. Um, okay. So we're, we're talking about the fact that conflict is often about something getting triggered inside of us. Um, and it can be both family of origin. It can also be our wiring. Mm-hmm. We talked about the fact that there's triggers and then there's this communication style that can just be really frustrating and misunderstanding. So think about, um, different languages. And if we were to go different places in the world, there's different meaning for different body language. There's different meaning for different words. Um, and so even in England and in America, English words mean different things. Um, so the same is with personalities and wirings. So we use the core values index. We're going to walk you through the four different communication styles okay. that people have and um, how that can create some confusion within the the realms of conflict. Yeah. And just getting back to the idea, you see me using my hands, uh, kind of just how we miss each other all the time. Right. And so much of that has to do just with this point of communication and the communication style. So the CBI has four frames. We love this tool for that reason. It's not like laborious and a huge, you have to have a backpack or a library of of information to kind of apply this. There are primary four, primarily four communication styles here uh, that uh, humans use. Now, the, should I tackle the first two and then you you get the it. second? Okay. Mm-hmm. So I'll start with um, this builder frame and then the merchant frame, terrible cover, innovator, and banker. And just a quick note. So builders are the action kind of people, male, ma- men or women. Uh, tra- this tool transcends age and gender and culture. It's a fingerprint, right? So the scores that you get essentially are kind of getting us closer to fingerprint. All of the tools are trying to get to unchanging hardware nature. CVI does the best job at that that we've found. And the builder's communication style, they are just action people that that seek to make a positive difference. They want results. They're motivated internally out of the womb until the day they die. High builders are um, people who are uh, just movers and shakers. And so they communicate no, in, uh, not to no surprise in a very to the point fashion. Mm-hmm. So to the point, A to B as quickly and as effectively as possible. Why do we share what we share um, in to the point fashion? A builder would say they share it because we've got stuff to do. So just share what's necessary to get to the action that would lead to results. So how was your day? Fine. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> There's not a lot of fluff. Yeah, great. <laughs> um, it sucked. You know, th- those kinds of phrases would be to the point, and and uh, a builder might answer that. Uh, so 
so different than the uh, merchant's uh, core value. And merchants are people, people. I mean, not to say that builders don't like people, but merchants are the people, people. Like the more the merrier in, in relationship, they are the most relationally intuitive and uh, they, uh, they need people to even learn, right? They can't, they, they need human beings to do what uh, their communication style is, which is, uh, you see my finger here doing a roundabout, okay? They are the verbal processors of the community, of the world, right? Those that talk and learn this way, um, talk and listen, uh, they do it in a roundabout fashion. So where uh, the builder has an A to B, the, the, the merchant has an A that starts here, but they are searching for the B and they need to do that by talking to another human being. Well, that is not um, a linear process. That is a very free-flowing, feeling sensory uh, process that is uh, merchants are communicating. There could be some bunny trails in there. Uh, and merchants, they, they will use that process, which is so normal for them, to get to the conclusion, the B, if you will, that they are looking for. So it is so funny. You might get that classic knock on the door at home, at work, wherever you are. And a merchant will say, Hey, do you got a second? That's kind of the classic merchant lead in. Mm -hmm. And the person who's in listening, on listening in, if, they, if you, if you say, yeah, sure. You'll watch the merchant do this picture. And that's why we created that picture so that you can literally see them do this. And if you're not a merchant and it's not normal language for you, you know, let's say you're a builder, you can kind of go, okay, I got time for them to do some roundabouting. I'm going to stay present. Let them do that. And watch what happens. And in many cases, at the end of getting to their B, the merchant might simply say, thank you so much. That's just what I needed. And you as the listener didn't say a word. Hmm. People usually laugh when, I, uh, when they realize that this is happening. So these images are really helpful. Yeah. And so often in, you know, when you're in a conflict, the merchant is really needing to tell their story and the emotional part of how things impacted them. And the builder at the end of the day is just like, did you do it or not? Very like, task. Yeah. And, yeah. and ownership, it becomes really a big deal in their communication. So we're moving to the innovator. The innovator are our idea people, their wisdom and compassion and that they love to collect data in order to figure out the right way to go. And their greatest contributions end up being um, assessment and solutions. And so oftentimes they're in their head. They make a sense of the world in the way that they think and connecting the dots um, in their own head. And when they speak, it's usually after a lot of connecting some dots inside their own head. Their communication style can often be complex in that if I asked someone, you know, what do you want to go um have for dinner, an innovator's got a lot of questions along with that. So in their head, they're thinking, well, it depends. It's very complex. Depends what our budget is and what we ate last night and what we you ate last night. What are we hungry for? What are the traffic patterns? Uh, what are we what are we going? What's the closest? What's the farthest? There's a new restaurant I was thinking about trying and oh yeah, maybe is this the time to try that one? That's right. Yeah. It's very <laughs> complicated. And so everything that they're um, trying to get out of their head head can feel disconnected to the listener, but it makes a lot of sense to the innovator. And honestly, if given enough time, they can connect the dots and make sure that people understand what all of the complexity that they're holding. They prevent problems from happening in relationships and in systems. That's kind of what their gift are is. But in conflict, it can be really um, paralyzing to have all of these potential problems in their head and an inability to get that all out. Or when they get it out, it can come across in a very um, unhealthy, interrogative way. So you use the word compassion. Just explain that because it's not what people usually think, like sympathy or empathy yeah. in this frame. So what is the, the compassion of the innovator? That's right. So innovators are more cognitive. The merchants are the emotional part of the wirings, um, but cognitive thinkers are the innovators. So their compassion is less about feeling and more about their ability to wait for the right solution or the right answer. So they want to stay, they want to remain inquisitive and open. They love gray. They love being able to kind of take in their time to make sure that they've considered all the options. So that's what compassion means in terms of core values. But sometimes innovators can assess really quickly and they come to that conclusion fast. And when they don't, they lean into that compassion and they're going to take their time to get it right the first time. So that's so different, right? Then, uh, I mean, it can complement the builder 
in a to the point fashion, right? When, when uh, an innovator assesses quickly and that works great when that's happening. Um, it can work well with merchants when um, merchants are roundabouting and innovators can assess options and are joining in that area. But can you start to see the breakdowns that happen mm -hmm. uh, between the communication styles when one or both begin to go in conflict? And what was the last one? Well, before we move to the last one, I wanted to say that the the visual for um, the innovator is a kind of like a sundial where their A is at the center and then there's just a lot of Bs. They have the most amount of Bs when it comes to. So when somebody asks me as a high innovator, when somebody like Jeff asks me a question, I have to really genuinely say, do you, I have a couple Bs that I'm holding. Um, otherwise, if I just start talking, then he thinks what I'm saying at first is the thing I'm landing on, but I'm not landing there because I have a few B's that I'm holding. That's the compassion side of saying I haven't decided yet. So as an innovator, the communication style can be confusing sometimes because it sounds like I'm being decisive, but I'm actually just throwing out a bunch of ideas and I'm wanting to throw it into the mix. That can be very frustrating for certain wirings. Um, and the last is the banker. The banker are our, there are justice and equity people. They really believe in making sure that everybody has the resources available to them and that there's equity in the community and in the relationship. They have a high justice meter, a right and a wrong, and they really want to know the facts, the how and the why of things. Okay. So their communication style is very linear, similar to the builder in that it's an A to B, it's going to go in a straight line. There's not a lot of complexity to it, but it's very detailed. So they need to hit every single point along the way to feel really heard and understood. And so it takes a just longer period of time to hear a banker share. So if we've got a conflict um, with a banker, it's going to require a little bit more time to be able to hear all the ways along the way that they have been hurt or the injustices that happened or where they felt like there was an equity, but those are the values of a banker and their communication style needs to um, be done in a very slow and methodical way. So it's a horizontal plane, similar to the, the builder, a, a and B is on a horizontal plane, but unlike a short arrow of that goes from A to B as quickly as possible, the banker has sort of a long line and it's not really a line. There's just a lot of dots in a linear fashion and every dot it, it matters and there's no skipping of dots and the bank bankers yes. are wanting people to understand the whole and, and the why, the how and the why of everything. And the justice side of them is really that information is used appropriately available to everybody. And so that's why they take so much time quantitatively to even communicate at the best of who they are. They take more time than the other three frames. So in conflict, it's even more important to uh, understand that they're visually, that's, that's how they communicate. That's how conflict needs to be addressed. It's going to be thought of in their frame as very connected fact base. Uh, let's, so let's, let's bring it together and think about uh, what we want our audience to know about conflict now and how these frames impact each other. Yeah. So really the bottom line, we're not giving you the full shebang. I mean, this is what we do with our clients. These are what we do in our retreats. We're processing long-term how to do this well in the relationships that matter most to you, whether that's your marriage, your family, or your organizational teams. Because conflict can be so hard and convoluted, but if we strip it all apart and we give it kind of a one, two, three step, first step is what the heck bugged me about what just happened? Is it that I'm low in blood sugar right now and I need to eat? Is it that I broke up on the wrong side of the bed? Is it that um, I this hitting on my childhood wounds? Is this, it's, um, I really don't understand what you're saying because you're speaking in a different core value than I am and what you're valuing and, and you, the words you're using are not computing with how I think and I'm wired. Um, so we're slowing down to identify what's really underneath it for me. Before we head into conflict, that's where some of the worst sinning happens. We're at the, our like ugliest points, right? And we have to come back and do a lot of asking for forgiveness and, and um, we just don't feel the best of ourselves. The best healthy conflict is when I've done some good assessing. So this can be through prayer. This can be through journaling. And this is also when we ask for healthy feedback from the people that are most important to us, whether that's counselors, mentors, friends, um, 
and, and we're being able to get some feedback before we're going to come back and say, hey, at the end of the day, this is what bothered me. You're describing regulating, you know, that clinical term about how we regulate and the processes that we use to regulate. In the moment, you want to use skills that help you as an individual stay in the best of who you are, as opposed to kind of going into the place where you sin the best, right? <laughs> so uh, I've, I've personally benefited from that. So what, you know, where's this coming from? What, what is my need? What is happening here? And wherever I can, uh, take time to be able to unpack it, try to understand what that's going on. Um, using this CVI frame, it's wonderful. Here's an example of this. So I might say, um, we really need, I'm feeling like we're never going to get to action, right? In my builder core value. And I'm feeling in my body a need to get going. Like this conversation is is gone far beyond what I thought it would be. And I need to own the fact that I didn't ask for how long it might be and to tell you in advance that I had 30 minutes, I didn't have 45, and now we're at the 45 mark and my body is feeling like I am late to other things that were important. So I'm communicating that with you, you're hearing that. And um, and then where we take it, right? You would take that from, from your either your merchant or your innovator, which are your big values, uh, take it from there. Well, at that point, um, we would probably take a time out. You know, we'd say we need to take a break. And when you take a break in any sort of, that can be even in a board meeting. I've advised that to say when there's, everybody has shared their side and everyone's just frustrated and doesn't agree. Um, you can agree to disagree or you can take a break and go calm down. It takes literally 30 minutes to return the blood flow from our amygdala and our downstairs part of our brain, the fight, flight, or freeze part where we start to do our best sinning and return that back to the full um, coverage of our brain into our frontal lobe where we're going to make a little bit more wiser decisions. And so being able to step away, go calm ourselves down, and sometimes even just taking 24 hours in big decisions, it's wise to spend some time in prayer and reflection before coming back. Because often God will work in that to help you kind of make more meaning of what you heard. Um, we are not the best listeners. I don't mean Jeff and I, I mean humanity <laughs> are not the best listeners when we are hijacked and our brains are not working for us. They're working against us. Um, our bodies are telling us you are in trouble. So we act as if we're in trouble. But then you take some time, take a break, then come back together. And that question of, do you have time to talk is now a good time. It's always a healthy tool to throw into healthy conflict resolution is now a good time. And if not, when's a good time for us to talk again about that conversation we ended on yesterday? If in the moment, like for as a, it's personal between you and I as a couple, I and I call a timeout. I'm not calling the timeout for you. That never works. And it certainly wouldn't work for you to say, oh, you need a timeout, Jeff. Yeah. <laughs> nope. No. That wouldn't so work. You, you call it, you call it for us and you call it for yourself. Even if you are calling it, you know, in some respects, uh, for the other person out of love. And, and then that person has a responsibility to say, here's when, um, here's when I'll come back mm -hmm. and will that work for you? So that's not leaving the other person hanging. Like, you know, one that person feels with, a bit like abandonment when you do one that. person with all the power to say, I'm out of here. I'm calling a timeout. You got to call it the time in and say, and, and ask it, will that work for you? Like mm -hmm. for us, I need, I need the um, time for my blood to return from my amygdala, which is like getting into that fight, flight or freeze mechanism, usually fight for me. Uh, to, uh, to back to the frontal lobe so that I can hear your point of view. I cannot right now. I'm triggered. I'm overwhelmed. My brain is flooded. So can I have the 30 minutes and can we come back in 30? I, I will commit to you doing to do that. Is that okay with you? Yeah. And you would say, oh, what would I say? I'm kidding. <laughs> I would say if I do a good job at giving the time out and time in in the best of myself, I would say, thank you for doing that. We'll talk again. And then it's a cue for me to go calm down and then we'll come back and I'll say, yes, now yes. is a good time. Yes. The best of you. We're but the worst the of me pushes the boundary. So let's be honest. The best of me pushes the boundary and says, I'm not done talking and I have more to say. <laughs> And so oh, do not leave. Right. Do. And so that has been a maturing process for both of us is to honor the timeout. Yeah. So if we say anything during conflict resolution, the, the more mature one's going to honor it. So I, that helps me in my pride of like, okay, you want to be the more mature one, Tara, or do you want to be the immature one? And I want to be a mature one. I really do. Me so too. I want to keep in step with the Holy Spirit. I want to um, be more Christ-like and I want to be a mature adult. 
we are getting some reps ourselves in very these very things that we're talking about. You have to practice. If you don't and you wait to the moments, that's where our worst sinning happens, yes. right? So practice gives you a chance to regulate better. I'm much more aware of what's happening in me, in my mind, in my body. I didn't even know anything about what happened in my body beforehand as I was starting to get triggered into that fight mechanism. So being aware of that, what the cues are for yourself first and then for your significant other is very, very helpful. Understanding how they're wired and how they communicate and prefer to communicate is so important outside of conflict. So practicing honoring the different person's wiring and how they prefer to communicate and receive communication. But then in so that you're more ready for it in conflict because it's all exacerbated when when somebody's upset, somebody's been hurt, somebody's been um, uh, missed. Yeah. And so how we do repair, you can have all kinds of conflict, but coming back and doing the repair is really the sign of a healthy relationship. And the research shows that the quicker the repair, the healthier the relationship. So meaning if you had um, a hurt and you haven't dealt with it in 10 years, it, that's a sign of unhealth. Or um, a hurt. And I'll say, well, I'll let her be the one to come back and apologize first. Right. Okay. <laughs> so, or minimizing and thinking it's no big deal. Well, if somebody's hurt in the relationship and needs to talk, then it's worth it. In, in a healthy relationship, we both get to be honored. We both have needs. Now, do we want to pick every battle? No. So that's part of the slowing down and checking in and going, is this worth, is this me? Or is this something I need to really come and talk to Jeff about? Or can I regulate this myself and get some food and not be hangry anymore? That's kind of the reality uh, to a lot of the conflicts is we're just unaware. So if we've done that, we're aware of our contribution. We're aware of what we actually want to talk about. We've calmed ourselves down. We've asked now is a good time. You have heard us share this before, but we're going to share it again because it's the gold to calming and resolving conflict, um, which is listening to one another and giving it a chance. So we take turns. We don't go back and forth like a ping pong table. We're going to literally throw someone the ball and they get to keep it until they're done. And then... The other one gets to have a turn. And by the end of that conversation, usually there is some better senses of I can own something, you can own something. Will you forgive me? And we work through that. We talked about forgiveness at the end of 2023. If you want to go back and listen to that, we've talked about other places of communication and conflict resolution throughout the podcast. But today we just want to review the basics of mirroring, validating, and empathizing as we land the plane today in this podcast. So what is mirroring, Jeff? Yeah, so this is often called active listening or effective listening. You probably have heard of this. We didn't come up with it, but we certainly use it because it's effective and important. So mirroring is when someone has spoken to you. Let's say I'm the listener and Tara's spoken to me. Uh, as the listener, I am going to first mirror back things I heard. I'm going to try to stick to what the words that she used, right? It's important because every speaker, no matter if it, whoever it might be, whoever's sharing, whenever any of us is sharing anything, we really care about being understood. And just, you know, when things go awry, when, when we pretend that we don't or that, uh, um, and we don't honor this in others. So I will repeat, I say, what I heard you say, great lead in was this and this and that. And, and you're using their words. In my case, I'd be using Tara's words. And then I might ask her, did I get that right? The whole point is I'm, I'm placing her as the speaker in the foreground. Mm -hmm. I'll have my turn after she goes through this process first uh, and as the listener. And so she might say, yeah. And then uh, we can make a shift, but there really isn't any interpreting going on here. And I find that it's amazing how easy it is to start interpreting or adding words that the speaker never used. And what that does is it increases that miss. And so this is helping us to reduce the misses through this, these steps. And it, you know, it takes, it's kind of quirky at first to start and it takes a little practice of course, but then it gets really natural. And it's the highest form of communication is to use all three of these. So mirroring is reflecting what the speaker has said, using their words, making sure and asking, did I get it right? And if they say well, mostly, then that's great. If there's more, then I say, well, is there more? And then they get a chance to add more. And I might mirror that back until I've asked the question again, did I get it right? And they say, you got it. 
Yeah. And with the different communication styles from the core values index, you'll understand that some of this will take go faster for some of the core values and I'll take longer True. for some of the core values. Um, if I'm in my merchant and I really need to feel my way through and do that roundabout, then I'm often going to say, yes, there's more. <laughs> you got a part. Uh, yes, there's more. Yes, there's more. But if I really get, um, and that's part of the, the being a partner in this, if I get that he's getting the gist of it, um, it's not a punishment. You're not trying to make him sit there and listen to every little thing, but trying to be gracious in getting the point, the bottom line of what you're both trying to say. So mirroring is reflecting that back, not interpreting. And before you go forward, just to use that example, it, knowing that Tara is a merchant first, and if I see her in that value where she is verbally processing, I am literally in my mind watching her do this, the roundabout, searching for the bee. And what is most important in that moment? That to a merchant relationship, body language, tone, presence, that she feels safe to be able to do that in front of me. And so that's how I'm integrating that wisdom right there in the mirroring with the high merchant. And I, I am just going to say, um, outside of core values, every single person, human being desires good body language mm -hmm. and presence. So even though merchants are the most tuned into it, I would say that every human being needs that. It needs yeah. a softer posture. It doesn't line up if you're trying to listen and mirror back, but your tone is, you know, snarky and harsh and your body language with the, sh you know, your arms folded and your brow kind of looking like, mm, not so sure. That's not going to breed safety. So yeah. body language is a huge part, a majority of the listening posture. So as you're mirroring back, sticking with the words you're hearing, and then the second piece is validating. Validating is not agreeing with. Validating is simply a mature posture to say, if I was in your shoes, if I had your wiring, if I was coming from that point of view, I can see how you landed there. I can see why that bothered you. I can see, I can see. And if you can't see, putting on their glasses. if you can't see it, then ask some more clarifying questions to say, I'm having a hard time understanding still, it doesn't mean you're not explaining it well, but can I ask a few questions? Help me understand what it meant when you said this. Again, posture and tone means I'm being curious. I'm not trying to be difficult. So this is the part of validation is getting to the point where I can put the glasses on and see things from your perspective, from a cognitive place. It's making sense how you got to that place. And the last only for the sake of time, we're going to just slide right into it, is empathy. Yeah, and empathy is really the gold standard, the gold currency of effective communication. It's what really the best communicators mm -hmm. use with one another. And in couples' relationships, they are they have, they have miles and miles of practice of, of exchanging empathy with one another. It changes us. And so empathy is kind of like a life ring, right? You would throw to somebody you know, from the shore who might... Um, who might even be in a situation where they feel like they're drowning, right? Mm -hmm. And it's not, uh, you, you toss this to say that after mirroring, I've understood correctly, I validated, I can see that you're not crazy for what you believe, even though I totally disagree with how you got there. It's not the point. I can see how you got there. Empathy is, if you notice a, a feeling that someone is exhibiting, the speaker is exhibiting, there's emotion there. It's joining them from the shore, seeing them out in the water and saying, I can see that you're sad, you're, you're connecting, or I can see that that made you really happy. <laughs> and you're joining them in, in that emotional space um, so that they feel that you are beside them in that way. It changes how we experience conversations and communication. It turns us towards one another. And uh, that is a beautiful thing to do. We need more and more empathy in this world everywhere. We do. And honestly, majority of us don't experience it um, in sincere ways. And to be able to do this with your most trusted people or the people you say you love the most is really the challenge for all of us. Yeah. To offer empathy to the stranger at the grocery store is a very kind, good thing to do. But the challenge that Jeff and I would say is, hey, can you do that at home with the people that trigger you the most? So <laughs> um, there's this, this challenge, the longer you're in relationship with people, the more issues and concerns we have, that's normal. And I think the idea um, that we're really challenging to, is to say, we want to grow in our ability to do conflict well. I was just reading the book um, not too long ago, Dopamine Nation. I highly recommend it. It's a really hard read for, um, so I'm giving you a warning. 
But it's really the bottom line point that Anne Lemke is saying is like, at the end of the day, we've lost our ability to handle pain and we're trying to numb out and avoid at every single level. And that there is a human biology, there is a spiritual formation, there is just even just pure um, relationship growth that comes only from pain points and conflict resolution. If you're stuck in pain and you never resolve it, that's really unhealthy and causes all kinds of other funky problems. But to just avoid it altogether or the moment we feel or sense pain, we just drop the relationships, we cancel, we just, we move on and we don't move toward, we are not one being in our best selves, our most mature selves, but we're missing out on the greatest gift that God's giving us, which is community, being known, being understood and making it through the hard times. So we look back and we go, wow, look at what we did. Yeah. And I'm also reminded of Dr. Vanderkolk's uh, quote as it relates to unresolved trauma in this world, which is basically unresolved conflict. Uh, it, trauma is anything by his definition, anything out of the ordinary that makes a person feel helpless or powerless mm. in, in relationship. And so we have all of this unresolved comp, uh, conflict and trauma in this world all around us in, in our homes. And if we are not resolving and moving through, he literally says it's the greatest health crisis in our country, in our world, really unresolved trauma. Um, and yeah. so we want to work through, we need practice, we need reps, we, we need examples. And we want to set examples for those of us that are parents um, of practice and of resolution um, so that our kids can see and have a better model, right? That's what we're trying to do. We're trying to do that in our own relationship, in our own, in, in our own family system here. Um, we want to encourage you to do the same. And, you know, we have expertise in this and yet we still step on each other's toes as de as dance partners and do the and forget to do the things or intentionally do the our best sinning with those that we love the most it's challenging and convicting that's why thank god that we have um, grace from him and then grace with each other and we we get to keep practicing keep learning keep growing so that we can hopefully really live in that space more and more and more where we are exchanging empathy uh, seeing one another, it's it's safe for each other more and more and more uh, until the day that uh, until the day we depart. Well, I am so glad that you decided to hang with us. We are doing longer episodes. Can you tell? <laughs> And so if you have to stop and digest, that's good. But what we've decided is we really want to help come alongside you in the relationships that matter most to you, helping you be the leader that lives and um, lives out with integrity your life in every relationship at work, at home, in the community. And we're going to keep giving you um, the best that we have. We're going to be bringing on guests to continue this year. We've got an amazing lineup, but people that we love and respect that we're going to be having really intentional conversations with this year. So we hope you hang out with us longer, share this episode with someone, maybe even the spouse or the friend that you want to practice this with, or the colleague. Um, this would be an opportunity for us to grow this year in learning how to do good conflict well. Um, and if you've got a suggestion or you want uh, a specific topic for us to address, you can find me at Tara Matson and you can DM me. I'd love to hear from you. You can also follow us at living underscore wholehearted on Instagram and Facebook. And then we would love for you to be a part of our ongoing newsletter list. Um, so go to livingwholehearted.com where you'll see all of our services as well as our newsletters. And we're providing resources with you, for you every month to be the leader that you would follow. Well, did you know that we're not just podcasters? One of the best ways to connect with Tara and I and our whole team at Living Wholehearted is our website, livingwholehearted.com. There you're going to find the books that we've written, our e-courses, executive coaching, organizational development, and professional counseling services. And then one of our favorite things that we're up to these days, our Wholehearted Leadership Cohorts, where we take groups of leaders for one to two year journeys together. It's amazing. While you're there for fresh content, make sure that you sign up for our e-newsletter. That's where we're putting out stuff every month that you want to keep close with. So visit livingwholehearted.com.
You can also join us on socials at living underscore wholehearted on Instagram, and we are living wholehearted on Facebook. You can also follow me at Tara Matson on Instagram. We love to engage with you personally there. So make sure you reach out, leave us a review if you're enjoying this podcast. Hey, thank you for caring about being the kind of person and leader that lives with integrity.